Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now last week, we left off with Paul discussing those that he called enemies of the cross. And these were individuals, he said, who minded earthly things. And so now what he does is he just finishes this, this chapter, this, this direction that he's been teaching with the complete opposite, the complete contrast to this issue. And he now contrasts these false brethren with true believers and the heart of a true believer that er eagerly waits for the Lord to return from heaven. And he calls them citizens of heaven. So read with me here. He says, verse 24, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, not might, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue, how many things? All things to himself. Now, two short verses, but boy, there is just so much in these two verses. It's just incredible. So what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? I think you have to start there, because he, he speaks here about our citizenship that's in heaven. So if you are a believer, then you are a citizen of heaven. But what does that mean? What does it mean to mind heavenly things? in contrast to those that are minding earthly things. There is a big difference between the two. Well, the primary thing about being a citizen of heaven is that your allegiance is to another kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. That's the simplest, most obvious state thing that you can come to from this statement. That's the conclusion we must come to. My allegiance is to another kingdom, to a higher kingdom than the kingdom of this world. And so one day the scripture says the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And so this world will one day become a part of his kingdom. And I'm telling you, only citizens of heaven are going to enter that kingdom. And so this is something that you want to be. So it means, literally, my allegiance is to another kingdom. What does that mean? Well, it means that I have one master. It means that I have one Lord. You remember Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, he said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other, he said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, that is an absolute statement. When Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters, you cannot serve God and mammon, he means it. There is no in-between. There's no neutral place. And yet, people try and find that neutral place all the time. But there is no such place. I am either serving the one Lord, or I am serving some other Lord, some other master in my life. It means that I will demonstrate this allegiance to this one master by doing what Jesus commanded, to seek first the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. But what we do is we search and seek after all those things first, and then we put the kingdom second. So we need to put the kingdom first, and all the other things will take care of themselves. And so this is what it means to mind heavenly things. In opposition to verse 19, where it says, these that were enemies of the cross they set their mind on earthly things. So what you have to do is set your mind on heavenly things. 
Now, this word mind is a very interesting word. It means to regard or to savor. It's the word that Jesus used when he rebuked Peter. When, he, when Peter came to Jesus and said, you know, Jesus, you're not going to have to go to the cross. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Save yourself. And Jesus said this to him in Matthew 16, 23. He turned to him and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. Why? For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And so this word literally means to regard or to savor the things of men. Now, savoring is something that we all do quite often. Sometimes, usually on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon, when the barbecue is going. And you have a piece of meat on there, and you're, you can smell it. Oh, you, you open the door to the, to the backyard, and you smell that, and you just your mouth starts to water. And you want a little taster. Cut me a taster. Uh, I need to taste that. Because you can't wait. You're, you're just eagerly waiting for that meat to get done. And so that's what this word means. It means to savor the things of heaven. So think about it. Do you hunger? Do you thirst for more of him? Do you savor? Do you salivate at the thought of knowing him better? You see, that is what a true believer should experience. They should experience that excitement. Now, if that is not something that takes place inside you, you, you... you look at reading the Bible or you going to church or, you know, praying or something, you just go, okay, I guess I have to do this. That's the opposite of this word. This is, you're, you're not, I mean, it's like, do I have to eat this steak? You know, I, I don't, I don't want to eat it. But, so I'll eat it for you if you want. You can just send it over to my house. But what I'm trying to say is that you, when this takes place, you're in danger. You're in, you're in true danger. You need to be sensitive to your own heart. You need to keep a good eye on your, your own attitude because this is danger because there's not that excitement, that hunger there in your heart. This is why Jesus said, Hung, those that hunger and thirst for righteousness They shall be filled. They will be filled. It's going to happen. Now, secondly, to be what it means to be a citizen of heaven is that you're governed by the laws of the king of kings. You're governed by a set of laws that are higher laws than the laws of men and the laws of this earthly kingdom. Now, many of the laws that we originally had in our country were all based upon the scripture. They were based upon biblical truth. Now, that is changing radically in our, in our society today. This is what's called uh, our laws and our culture based on the Judeo-Christian ethic. You've, you've heard that term many times. Well, the Judeo-Christian ethic comes from this, the Bible. And so, when we look at our laws about concerning murder or manslaughter or theft or any of these things, the laws that we have, that even the definition of those laws came directly from Scripture. And so this is an essential concept to understand. So many of those laws were in harmony with God's law. But what happens today is those laws are slowly being changed. And we see that, you, you hear it, and, you know, somebody asked me the other day, they said, you know, hey, I, I hear that, you know, they're going to, they want to legalize recreational pot here in the state of California. That's going to come up on your November ballot. And so what are we going to do if they vote it in? And I said, well, what do you think? You should you just go get high? Is that what you think you should do? Well, no, but... What, what should we do? Or what, what, are you, what are we going to tell people? Well, we're going to tell them that 
again, there's a higher law. And the higher law is right here in the scripture. The higher law says, I will not be brought under the power or the influence of anything. And so it's just like alcohol. It's just like any other substance that brings you under its power. The scripture says, don't do it. In addition, the scripture says that uh, drug use for pleasure or enchantment is what's called a work of the flesh in, in Galatians chapter 5. You can read it. It's translated in, in your English version with the word witchcraft. And the word, the Greek word literally is the word pharmakia. It's where we get our word pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, pharmacology. You, you can easily see this. The definition of that word is the use of drugs for pleasure or enchantment. Enchantment is for anything spiritually, uh, in getting involved in spiritual things. And so in, in the first century, many people in witchcraft or sorcerers, they all used drugs. So it's either translated sorcery or witchcraft. But it is the use of drugs. And so the scripture says there, it's a work of the flesh. And it says, they that practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty plain. It's pretty clear. Pretty, pretty direct. So we have a higher law. And that higher law must be govern the actions of our life. And so, are his laws your supreme desire, your supreme responsibility? Yes, absolutely. Those laws must govern you if you are a citizen of heaven, an essential thing. And we submit ourselves to man's laws until these laws contradict the laws of of God. And that is the basic problem. Now, if, if any time in the future persecution is going to come down on the church, it's going to be because you are violating man's law. That's what it's going to come down to. That's Historically, that's what and why Christians are persecuted. They violate the laws of those who are in power. If you live in the Middle East, it's the law of the Quran. You are violating those, so you either submit or you die. That's it. Under the Roman Empire, it was you confess that Caesar is Lord or you're an enemy of the state. And so that's why Christians died and were martyred in those days because they would not confess that, Jesus, that Caesar was Lord. And so do you see the issue? That's what's going to take place. And so today as we see the change in laws concerning homosexuality, gay marriage, uh, the bathroom issue that is such a big deal today. I mean, those are, it's just, those are three big issues that have all taken place in just the last couple of years. And those issues are going to make you out to be a bigot, an intolerant bigot. That's the way you're going to be viewed. And I hear it on the, on the news programs and those, the talk shows. I, I hear it. They're, you know, as Christians, they're a bunch of bigots. They're a bunch of intolerant people. Why? Because we won't submit to their view and their values that they are espousing. And so we, we believe in a higher law. In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, there when Peter and the other apostles were commanded not to preach any longer in the name of Jesus, there Peter said, and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And what happened to them after they said that? They were beaten. So that's what's going to happen. As soon as you make that determination, that's the result of it. 
We haven't had that problem because there hasn't, that agenda has not been allowed to come to the forefront. But our whole society is, this is a, we're in a post-Christian age in our country. And I mean, more than half of our country does not believe in what you believe in. Okay, they don't believe in what the scripture teaches. And the surveys all show this. And so be ready. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, it says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to any other authority. So it's basically, I am to submit myself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, until those laws contradict God's laws. That's the bottom line. So that is the second way that we are citizens of heaven. The third is that you, if you are a citizen of heaven, you are an ambassador of this other kingdom. If we are citizens of heaven, we must be ambassadors of that kingdom and of that law and of those values. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, there Paul says very clearly to the disciples, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And so what does an ambassador do? An ambassador represents the views and the positions of their own, of their own government of another government. They're living in another country, but they're representing the views and the opinions and the will of their own government. And so they are there to represent those views. If they don't represent those views, that ambassador is going to be recalled. And someone else will be sent that is in harmony with the government that's sending them. So I don't want to be recalled, okay? I don't want to be recalled. I want to represent the views of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So do you stand up for those values and the views of the kingdom of heaven? Do you stand up when the, those conversations come up at the break table in your office, in your family, with your friends? Do you stand up for the truth because that's what it means to be a citizen of heaven and an ambassador of that kingdom. Now fourth, if you are a citizen of heaven, you're going to be looking for the return of the king of this kingdom. You're going to be looking forward and you're going to be looking forward eagerly for his return. And that changes a person. It, it changes everything that takes place inside you. So if your allegiance is with Christ, you're governed by his laws, and you believe that king of that kingdom is coming here again one day, then you're eagerly going to look for it. That's what he says here. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. Now the word eagerly wait there is in the present tense. It means to continually, eagerly wait. Every day. Every day of your life. That's what it's all about. And so are you eagerly waiting and looking? You know, many times I have people say to me, gosh, maybe today. And, and I know that person's looking. Maybe today. And I, I hope maybe tonight. Because... That kind of eagerness is real, and it's something that changes the inside of you. Jesus said in John 14, verses 2 and 3, he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Now, he's not talking about uh, big houses. This is a word, Greek word that means dwelling places. And he's specifically talking about the new body that he's going to give to you. And we're going to look at that aspect in just a minute. But he says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. And he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That's his word. That's his promise. That's, it's a fact. That's what he is going to do one day. Whether I die or whether he returns to this earth while I am still alive, he is going to do that work. And he's going to give me that dwelling place to dwell in forever. And so to wait is, is truly, to eagerly wait is a powerful thing. And so have you ever, I mean, to illustrate this, I mean, you know, have you ever gotten a phone call from a friend you haven't seen in a long time or a family member you haven't seen in a long time and they say, you know what, I'm just, I'm just pulling up to your street. I'll, I'll be there in a few minutes. And you walk out onto the front porch and you're eagerly looking down the street for them to drive up. Have you ever done that? And that's what he's talking about here. You're eagerly looking. It's like you're standing on your front porch looking, waiting for them to, to show up. And that's what he wants us to do. If you're looking for his return, you're looking for things that are not seen. You're looking for eternal things as opposed to the enemies of the cross in verse 19 who are looking for earthly things. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, Paul said, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So where is your focus tonight? Where's your focus been this last week, this last month, this last year? Is it on earthly things? Or is it on heavenly things? Is that where your mindset is? Is that what you're savoring? Because that really is critical. It's critical for your spiritual life and for your growth. It's because you're looking for something eternal. Looking, I believe, causes you to walk in holiness. It changes your conduct. It changes everything that you do because it changes the way you make decisions. Let me show you this in the scripture. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. He says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So it's all going to burn. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, not might be dissolved, will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And then look at the word 12. Looking for, uh, for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. Notice he uses the word look or looking three times in this text. It's that attitude of the heart. You're looking for something eternal. And if you are, then it will change you in your conduct and your godliness. That's what he declares. And so this is why it is such a critical aspect of the Christian life. So are you looking? And are you eagerly looking? Are you looking with, with hope and with faith? This is what is coming to pass. I pray that you are. Now, next here, Paul goes on to look at the greatest benefit and the joy of our citizenship. That's what takes place in verse 21. He says, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed 
to his glorious body. To his glorious body. So this is, this is the greatest benefit of being a citizen of the kingdom. The first benefit that he describes here is just the transformation of your body. So this transformation re he's referring here to is what's going to take place uh, upon your death or his return. When you go to be with him, when you put off this body, you are going to be transformed instantaneously. The scripture says in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. I'm going to read that in just a moment. But that's what it says. It's going to take place. And so when that moment occurs, your body is going to return to the dust. And your new body is going to be made out of heavenly material. And that will last for an eternity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, there Paul says, We know that if our earthly house... This tent is dissolved or destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And so this is referring to that dwelling place that Jesus was referring to. These two passages are speaking of the same issue. So I have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He says, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. In other words, we will not be, when we die, we're not some unembodied spirit, some floating around out some place in the universe. We are not ever going to be an unembodied spirit. That's what it's clearly teaching here. When, I, when this body is dissolved, notice he calls it a tent. A tent is a temporary dwelling place. So this is a temporary dwelling place. The eternal dwelling place is waiting for me. It's eternal in the heavens. Jesus said he went to prepare it. How long did it take him to prepare it? Just like that. It's prepared. It's eternal in the heavens. It's there. And the moment you die, you're going to move from one tent into another one. I'm looking forward to that. This old, painful, disease-ridden, weak, and corrupt old body is just going to die. And I'm going to get a new one. Now, I don't care whether you're old or young in this room. I'll bet you you have either an ankle problem, or a neck problem, or a knee problem, or a back problem, or a, a you're going to have some kind of problem or a blood issue or sugar issue or I don't know. Everybody's got something. And the older you get, the more of those you get. And, you know, you begin to think, none of this stuff is functioning the way it's supposed to function anymore. And it's because this is a temporary dwelling place. The tent always wears out, right? I mean, I've, had, I've owned a lot of tents. A lot of them, and they all wear out. So you just you use it until it can't it can't take keep the the rain off of you anymore, and it's it's ripped or something is not working well. You just you get rid of it and you get a new one. So this is what is going to take place. And so when you when you have those aches and pains and you Things just are not going well. Or you, or you strain and tear a ligament or whatever. You just, you just go, this is, just, this is a body that is just not made to last. It's not. They, nobody can make one better, that's for sure, than what God has done. I mean, they can't make a heart to, peep, to beat 70 or 80 beats a minute for 80 or 90 years. They, they still have not perfected that. I mean, even the new joints that they're putting in, they say only last 20 years. So, I mean, everything wears out because it's all temporary. So, I'm looking for the one that's eternal. 
the one that will last forever. And so this new body is going to be fit to last forever in the environment of heaven. And that day is coming soon. Now secondly, notice he goes on here to say, he, say, he basically uses this idea that, that God can take and transform this corrupt, weak body and he can transform it. It's, see, we're made to go to the dust, right? In uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, it says there, the curse that came upon man. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So every one of our physical bodies is going to return to the dust because that's what we're made up of. It's just we're just made up of the basic elements in dirt. So that's it. So out of the dust of the earth you were made, and to the dust you shall return. So if God can take that which is destined to go to dust, and he can transform it into something that will last forever, then that means he can do anything. Literally anything. Correct? That's the point that, that Paul is trying to make here. Let's read it again, verse 21. He says, Who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body? How? According to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now, the words he is able are in the present tense. He is continually able, which means right now, Anything, any time he chooses, he can transform and he can change anything. Anytime he wants. That's his ability. That's his power. So anything, anytime, right now. If God can change our bodies and reverse this effect that will take us to dust and then transform this body into a heavenly body, that's pretty powerful. The word subdue means to bring under subjection or to subordinate. So he is able to subordinate, to subdue every single thing. He can subdue anything. Now I have people say to me sometimes, you know what, I just can't, see, I can't do this. I can't change. I can't, I can't, I can't. You fill in the blank. We've all said it, haven't we? At some time, I, I mean, I remember when I tried to quit smoking. I mean, when I was a brand new Christian. And I'm just going, I mean, I am, I just can't do this. I mean, this is just beyond me. I, I am just controlled by this, by this nicotine inside of me. And I'm telling you, it was, it was hard. On top of it all, I worked with a, a guy that chain smoked and and I mean, I'm trying to quit, and and this guy's just, you know, changed. He's just lighting one cigarette with the other cigarette, you know. And I'm just going, how am I going to do this? And I and I just I just said, can I can I work in another house while you work in this house? I I'm trying to quit smoking. He goes, yeah, sure, man, go, yeah, go for it. And I go, okay. So that was a help, but it was still tough. It was still hard. It was a struggle. And yet, I remember talking to one of the pastors and he said to me, he goes, he said, you cry out to the power of God. You cry out to the, the power of heaven. And he said, he will deliver you. And you know what? God set me free and never gone back to it. And I don't want to. And so when... When you, you think about these things, you have to realize that God can do anything. This is what God said to the prophet Jeremiah. He says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? You see, is there anything too hard for him? No. 
absolutely not. There isn't anything too hard. I mean, if he can speak the worlds into existence with a word, then he can change anything. He can change anybody. He can do anything that is necessary. He can subdue all things. So God gave Adam and Eve the right and the privilege and the responsibility to subdue the earth. That was what he told them in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. He says, God then it says, bless them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. But what happened? They got subdued. They didn't subdue. They got subdued. How did they get subdued? By yielding to the lie of Satan. By believing someone else's word other than the word of, Christ, of, of God and of Christ. And so they yielded to this, their own pride, their own lust, and yielded to the temptation of the serpent. And so then, ultimately, what did God have to do? God had to subdue all things. It says in Micah chapter 7, verse 19, here prophetically, it tells us what he is going to do. It's his, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. I love that verse. I love it, I love it. Because I know what happens if you drop something over the edge of the boat. You see, if you drop something over the edge of the boat, I mean, one of the guys here dropped his wedding ring over the edge of the boat one day, fishing out here. You ever think, you think he's going to get that back? It's gone. It's gone. And you're never going to see it again. So that's what he says about your sins. That's what he means when he says he's going to subdue all things. And so what a, what a grand privilege. And so now the Holy Spirit comes to live inside me to do that work, to enable me, the power of God. Notice it says here, again, according to the to the working. The working of what? The working of who? Well, it's the working of God. He is the one that's able to subdue all things. So the Holy Spirit is the one who lives inside you today because your sins have been forgiven and they've been cast into the depths of the sea and he's filled you with the Holy Spirit so that, that the law of the Spirit of, of Christ now subdues the law of sin and death. That's what Romans 8, 2 declares. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Made me free. You should take that those three words and box them in. Underline them. Made me free. I didn't get free. I didn't wiggle out of the the bondage of sin. No, he made me free. He made me free from the law of sin and death. And that's what it means to be a citizen of heaven. And so this is what it means to reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin and alive to God and to present yourself as a, a, a servant of God, a servant of his, to yield your, your life to him and to give yourself over to him, that's where freedom is going to be found. You have to choose to submit yourself. This is the first step of subduing yourself. You have to submit yourself. And so James says in chapter 4, verse 7, he says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will. He has to. There isn't, he doesn't have any choice. He's not stronger than God. If I submit myself to him, 
the enemy has to flee from me. That's what it's all about. And then he will fill me with his spirit and set me free from whatever is binding me. So tonight, what is binding you? What do you what needs to be subdued inside of you? What needs to be subdued? Is it fleshly desires? Anger? Resentment? Pride? Fear? I don't know. What whatever whatever you struggle with, that needs to be subdued. And the Holy Spirit is able to subdue it. If he can transform this piece of dust and make it a heavenly body, he can change and subdue anything. That's why Paul declares this. He is able even to subdue all things to himself. So choose to surrender. Choose to submit. And that's where freedom is found. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you that, Lord, there is freedom for each and every one of us. Not one of us here needs to be in bondage or controlled or captive to anything, any desire, any fear, anything, any substance. Lord, we just, we want to experience that freedom. And Lord, I pray that you would just set each one of us free here. Come and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us right now. Ask him. Ask him to just come and fill you at this very moment with the Holy Spirit. Allow him to just take control. Just say, Lord, I yield. I yield whatever it is that's that's holding me in bondage. Thank you, Lord. We believe you're doing that work of setting us free, even at this moment. We bless you. We believe in you. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to to wake up tomorrow morning eagerly looking for your return. Lord, may our lives demonstrate that we truly are citizens of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.